a definite integral. So what's a definite integral? Uh, well, I'll just read this. So take a function, define it over an interval as usual, a, a b. Um, the area under that curve is given by the definite integral. And I put area in quotes in there, and we'll see the reason for that in a second. So the definition, a definite integral is the integral that has, let's call them limits of integration or bounds uh, on the integral there, which reflect what interval, a to b, of inputs you're integrating the function f of x over. And you end up, if you evaluate that thing, you get the total signed area under the curve, where the total signed area under the curve just means that under the axis, you have negative area, and over the area axis, you have positive area. So for example, if we took a look at, I don't know, a sine curve here, this area would be calculated as positive, and this area would be calculated as negative. If it's below the x-axis, it's the area that's trapped between the function and the axis. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be where the uh, function intercepts the axis either, you know, like the picture from the last earlier, you know, we could look at a, B here, and then we could figure out the area trapped between the curve and the function. In this case, since it's all above the x-axis, that would all be included as positive area. And the result of your integral will be the combined positive and negative area. So if we looked at this one, if A was here and B was here, the integral from A to B of our function sine of x, well, I don't know, let's see, sine goes from zero to pi over there. So if this was negative pi to pi, and we integrate sine, and that actually is, this is negative pi, and this is pi, then sure enough, because you have symmetrical amounts of positive and negative area, they would actually end up being zero. And that's an example we'll explore later more, but hopefully that gives you some intuition as to what it means by signed area under the curve and the, why, the reason why I put like quotes around the area under or area and sometimes i'll quote under the curve as well so without telling you how to do that let's uh let's evaluate a definite integral to calculate the area under the upper hemisphere of the unit circle well i can see from my picture that my limits of integration and some people call these bounds of integration um are going to be from you're going to start at negative one and one the the Smaller numbers always on the bottom, and the bigger numbers always on the right, unless you want to switch them. And there's a property that we'll we'll deal with later, um, but typically we do it this way. Okay, so what is our function? Well, we need a function to represent that. I can't very well integrate that jazz. Um, and so far, we've we've been doing things in terms of x. So let's solve this rig in terms of x. Oh, I don't know. Let's uh, do that right up here y squared equals 1 minus x squared. Square root both sides get y is equal to plus or minus the square root of 1 minus x squared. And it turns out that the positive gives you the upper hemisphere, and the negative version of this would actually give you the lower hemisphere of the unit circle. So we want to figure out this area. So our expression in here would be 1 minus x squared. But you guys are thinking, wait a minute, the only rule we really have is the power rule. That's the only rule we've been introduced to so far. So we might have to get a little bit clever here, but I'm trying to build the intuition that the integral gives you the area under the curve. Well, do we actually need to do any calculus to do this, or could we sneakily just decide that we know the area of a circle is pi r squared, right? And so for this circle, our radius is equal to one, and so the area of the whole circle, entire unit circle, area, would be pi times r squared, r is one squared, so it'd be just pi. So this area is one half of pi. And so this integral, sure enough, represents the area under that curve. And using geometry, we figured out that the answer is pi over two. That's just meant to be kind of a fun example that we can use geometry to evaluate some relatively complicated looking integrals if the geometry happens to be nice enough. Let's try another one. Once again, again, we're, we're not doing anything here. Uh, maybe we'll do this, yeah, 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 yeah. Yep, okay. So use a definite integral to calculate the area under this curve. Okay, so I've got this thing graphed, y equals x minus one over the interval from zero to three. Hmm. So our integral would be from zero to three, and we're integrating the function x minus one dx. 
Now we have a power rule, so we could integrate this thing like it was an indefinite integral, and we would get one half x squared minus x plus c, and then we would kind of be like, what do we what do we do with these zeros and the threes here? And you guys have seen, some of you may have seen calculus before, so you may have an idea of what to do, but remember, we haven't introduced that yet. I haven't told you what to do with those bounds. So we're kind of stuck. This really didn't help us yet. So we're going to fire up some ge geometry. So for this blue th square, one by one square has area one. So this blue area has area one half, but since it's below the axis, it's going to be a negative one half. And this green area up here, well, this, this box would give us an area of positive one. And each of these triangles, respectively, would give us an area of positive one half each. So the entire uh, definite integral here would be negative one half plus all the green area now. So you have your blue area. Now, let me do this in colors. That will actually be a little nicer. Okay, so blue, we've got our negative one half here, and then all the green areas are going to be plus one half, that'll add to zero, plus one, plus one half here. And so those add to zero, and we end up with the area of one and one half. Now, if you're looking that, at that, and you're saying, wait a minute, area under the curve, that the well, it depends on how you define area. If you're looking for the actual area enclosed between the function and the x-axis, and you don't want positive and negative, you don't want the signed area, this is the total signed area, but it doesn't actually reflect the true captured area between the function and the x-axis. If you wanted the actual area between function, or y equals f of x, and the x-axis, you would have to count that, that blue area as positive, and then you would have to add up the green areas. And you would come up with two, one, two and a half as, as the actual answer for the true area enclosed between there and the x-axis. So whenever you're working with problems like this, just be sure that you know whether or not the problem is asking for the true area or the signed area. So back to our general goal that we mentioned at the beginning of the uh, the beginning of this section, we want to find the true area under a curve, and, and area has quotes around it because it's the signed area under the curve. So for over some interval, so you're going to divide it, the area up into thin rectangles, add up those rectangles, and then take the limit as those rectangles get thinner and thinner. So wait, that was two slides, was it? So let's kind of look at an example here. So we can do this process. We can actually do this process. We can take and look at um, some function, an example function, and we can do the math. We can divide up the interval over which we're interested in. In this image, it would be A would be over here at negative 4, and B would be over here at positive 4, as shown here. And we're, we have taken that area or that interval and split it up into 10, 10 uh, partition steps, if you will. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 splits gives me 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 rectangles. And we call this the left endpoint method because the height of our rectangles is determined by the left endpoint. Each rectangle is related to a specific input to the function, and then the height of the rectangle is determined by that point plugged into the function. So let's actually, this was just meant to be a visual kind of, here, this is what we're going to do. So let's do an actual example here. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, we have three, three of these to look at first, sorry. So yeah, you've got your left endpoint method. And what do we notice here? What do you notice with the left endpoints? Well, if you're looking at this, every single rectangle for this particular function, it won't always be true this way, but for this particular function, we're missing some area, right? So this is going to be a, um, this isn't going to be the best estimate. 
if our function you know took a left hand point and say it took a curve downward here we would actually have some extra area the point is it's not a perfect estimate but it still seems like it might be a fairly good one you could also do this game where you decide to use not the left endpoints, but the right endpoints for each rectangle. So once again, we split up this interval into a partition of 10 rectangles. And this time, each rectangle is defined by the right endpoint of those partition steps. And for this particular function, we have extra area. It won't always be extra. Sometimes it'll be um, a combination of extra and under, it just depends on the function and, and how curvy the actual function is. That's not the only way we could do this. We could also do this um, with midpoints. We could take a look at this same game and say, take the midpoint of every partition step and use that to define the height, that input in your function to define the height of the rectangle representing the area here. And oftentimes midpoints is kind of the best of both worlds because you get a little bit of air, a little bit of extra and a little bit of under count. So a little extra tied to a little missing. And sort of this combination of both the good and the bad can lead you to a better estimate. I'm going to flip back through these slides. Notice M10 there. It tells you this, this approximation says there's about 43.8 underneath. Right endpoints says there's about 44 underneath, which seems to be an entire overcount given the picture. So it seems like the true area is less than that. Um, and here, with left endpoints, you get 42. So each area, each method has an error to it. What's the exact one? We will get there. But the overall idea here is that if you took more and more rectangles, you'd get a better and better approximation of area for any method you used because the area, the, the error will go down. Um, oftentimes this is written as limit as delta x goes to zero because each of these little steps is the change in x. You define how big those steps are by the number of uh, rectangles you split this interval up into. And so some people actually write this as n goes to infinity because the number of slices going to infinity is the same thing will have the same effect as taking the slices, those rectangles, and making them thinner, delta x going to zero. So that's the idea. Now let's do an example. So I want to do this three times. We want to take y equals 1 minus x squared and integrate it over 0 to 1 using four rectangles. Or, I'm sorry, we're not integrating this. We're estimating the area. And then we're going to use all three methods, left, right, and midpoints. So having a look at our first one. Having a look at our first one, what do we get? Well, it seems here that for this left endpoint example, we're going to overshoot our area calculation. And I've, I've shown you the answer down there. It's, it's already clicked. But let's, let's do the math here. OK, so what is the, waste, the width of our base here? Well, we took 4, and we divided it. Uh, I'm sorry, we took 1. Uh, from 0 to 1, that's the length of your interval, and we divided it into four things. And so the our delta x, the, the width of the base of each rectangle, base of the rectangle, is 0 0.25. And you can kind of see that. This point right here is 0 0.25. And that point is at 0 0.5. And that point is at 0 0.75. Because remember, we're going from 0 to 1 here. OK, so now how are we going to calculate the actual area for all of these um, rectangles? Well, so what's the area of a rectangle? It's the area of a square or rectangle is equal to the base times the height. We usually think of this as length times width, but there's, you know, you can call them base times height, and that reflects our picture a lot better. So the base for each of these is going to be delta x. So let's make a table base, and then height for each rectangle. And then base times height gives us the area for each rectangle. Three things. OK, so our bases are all going to be 0.25. And we have four rectangles, so we'll just go ahead and fill in those right now. OK, so what is the actual height of this rectangle? Well, remember, this is the left endpoint here. So what is the first area defined by? Well, x is our left endpoint. 
And so what is this height? Well, look at that graph. That is the point on the curve that is related to the input zero. And so what is this height? That height is precisely our function evaluated at zero, which sure enough, one minus zero squared gives us one. So our height is f of zero. I want to emphasize that the height of your rectangle is given by the function output for the particular point which your rectangle is defined by, because that endpoint will always be drawn from the point on the curve. So what is the next one defined by? So the next one, this input is at 0.25. So look up there, sure enough, that point on the graph would be f of 0.25. And so what is that, f of 0.25? Well, that's equal to 15 sixteenths if you do a little math. And we're going to keep going here. So 0.5 relates to this point, and that point over here, sure enough, is f of 0.5. So f of 0.5 equals f of 0.5 is 3 quarters, turns out. And I'm out of colors. We're going to use yellow. F, oh, no, we're not. We're going to, that's not visible, so we're going to use black. Conveniently, it's already black. There we go. And sure enough, that probably looks like it's, oh, I don't know, it looks like half, but it turns out it's not. So f of 0.75 and f of 0.75 is equal to 7 sixteenths. And so what's the area of each of these rectangles? Careful here, you got to remember to multiply the base times the, times the height. So 0 0.25, 0 0.25 times 1 is 0 0.25. 0 0.25 or 1 quarter times 15 over 16. 0.25 times 3 quarters, and 0.25, the base width, times our height, 7 sixteenths. If you sum all that up, and guess what you get? You end up with 0 0.78125. And now that, they rounded to four places instead of five where I did my calculation. All right, so let's play this same game a little bit faster now with right endpoints. Okay, so the first one was an overestimate. The second one looks like it's gonna be an underestimate. We can see it's already been calculated for us. It's a little bit like 0.5. And so let's once again make our chart and figure things out. We've got our base times our height equals the individual rectangle area. And since it's the same partition, we know that our base is gonna be 0.25, 0.25. 0 0.25, 0 0.25, and that'll always be true. All right, so let's write in our inputs here, 0.25, 0.5, 0 0.35, and 1 and 0. Okay, so what is this first rectangle defined by? Well, the first rectangle is defined not by the left input this time, but by the right input, right endpoint. And so what is that height? And sure enough, that is f of 0.25. Okay, so our first height is going to be f of 0.25, and these numbers are things we we did last time. So this is going to be 15 over 16. All right, next the next rectangle is defined by this blue height there, and sure enough, that's f of 0.5. f of 0.5 is equal to three quarters, and the last endpoint there in green, which is kind of blending in. I apologize. That green is going to be f of 3 quarters. I said the last rectangle, but that's not true, is it? Why is that not true? Well, it's not true because there is one more rectangle. However, this rectangle is defined by its right endpoint, and its right endpoint has a height of 0 uh, for the function at that value. So f of 1 is 0. So that right, that rightmost rectangle, the fourth rectangle, contributes nothing to the area of this. So for each of these, 0.25 times 15 over 16, 0.25 times 3 quarters, 0.25 times 7 sixteenths, 0. Add all those together, get 0 0.53125. And once again, I did five decimal places, whereas they did three. Okay, and if you do want to play with this applet, I encourage you to. Uh, it was linked to in the prior slides. So last but not least, we'll talk about the midpoint method here, and it's the same game. Just because we're taking 
uh, midpoint here. We'll have to do a little bit of math, but the, the actual size here is still delta x equals 0.25. Every base is 0.25. So base times height equals area. Three things, and then we'll sum them all up. Four rectangles, each of them having a base of 0.25. And then now we need to figure out what are the numbers where that is going to be. Okay, so what is this first rectangle? That's notice this, let me write in these. This is 0.25, this is 0.5, this is 0.75. So what are these middle values going to be? Well, I'm going to cheat here because I didn't actually write it down. But, oh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. It's going to move by steps of 1 eighth. And so this first one, this first input is actually 1 eighth. The rest of them I'm going to leave out because I've done the calculations. Uh, f of 1 eighth is equal to, and f of 1 eighth is going to give us 63 sixty fourths. 63 60 fourths and then the next rectangle so this was this first rectangle here this next rectangle sorry i'm mixing up my colors a little bit it looks like it's going to be 55 60 fourths and I've, I've again i've calculated that and then this next rectangle the third rectangle i, I guess i should be emphasizing this yeah so this point corresponds to the height, which is f of 1 eighth. And sure enough, this height is defined by the function being evaluated at our red input value. This blue input value defining this rectangle is defined by the height of the rectangle, which corresponds to the height of the y-axis, which is the function evaluated at our blue input point. So that blue point gives us an area for that rectangle of 39 64ths. And if I'm truly honest here a little bit, I would admit that I, I think my handwriting on these notes is, is clear. These numbers are kind of faded, though. So this last fourth rectangle having 15 60 fourths. And then, okay, so what you do is you take and you do some math. And over here for the area, you get 0.25 times 63 60 fourths. Do the same thing for each of these. But I don't need to write all that because by now, hopefully, the game is beginning to be seen. And when you sum all these up, you get 0 0.671875. I added an additional number there, which, sure enough, matches to their calculation. Which one was the best? Well, let's look at what they were real quick. I'll thumb back to the beginning. 0 0.68 for this one. 0 0.5 for the undercount. 0.78 for the overcount. I feel like for this particular function, the best method in the this particular partition of four rectangles, uh, the best was the midpoint one. But it varies. It really does depend on the function. So let me see what I got here. So let's take a look at the actual result here. We uh, summed it, what I just kind of talked about: left endpoints, overcounted; right endpoints, undercounted; and midpoint was somewhere in the middle. If you actually do the definite integral, you do the true area calculation, you end up with 2 thirds, 0. 0.6666 repeating forever. So how could we get a better estimate? Well, I think we could all see that by increasing the number of rectangles or increasing the partition step, decreasing the partition step size, taking more partition steps, increasing n to infinity, or taking delta x down to 0, you're going to get a better estimate. And there's here's a slide showing that if we go from 4 to 10, we get closer to that 2 thirds, that 0. 0.66, getting 0. 0.71. And we're still overcounting because I'm using left endpoints here. But look what happens when you get 200 slices. You'd have to zoom in really far. And you you if you did, and you can do this, you'll see that there's a, still a little bit of an overshot there. And instead of instead of point the actual true area, which is just 0. 0.666 repeating, it still is going to get overshot by the time you get into the tens, hundred, thousands place. But if you truly took that limit to infinity, you would get the actual answer. So let's talk about the area formula for a single rectangle. Area equals height times base. We talked about how the base is always that step size, depending on your partition size, the change in x. And the height 
is f of x star. What, what does f of x star mean? x star is an input in each partition step. So if you have an x-axis here, and you're integrating from a to b, and you're trying to find the area here, and you, uh, you divide this thing up into n rectangles, each of these is going to have a uniform step size of delta x. And then to get a rectangle, you need to grab any point in there. Maybe it's the left endpoint, maybe it's the right endpoint, maybe it's the midpoint. And so you've got like an x star for each interval, saying this is like your i equals 1 first interval, and then x star sub 2 for your second interval, i equals 2. And that will give you a rectangle, which has a height, f of x star 1. And then this rectangle, maybe shorter here, has a height of f of x star 2. <coughs> Excuse me. Play that same game. Uh, maybe instead of star, I should have used like x sub i here because that's sure how it looks down in the formula below. What we're really seeing is the function gives you the height for each rectangle, and the step size for your partition gives you the base, and height times base gives you the area of each rectangle. And you just repeat that and add up those total sums. So let's do an actual concrete example of this. Um, so the first thing is, here is a method to calculate your partition step size. We're going to integrate, find the area, we're going to approximate the area, sorry, I keep doing that, of f of x equals x squared over x, or 0 to 2. We know x squared is the parabola, so we can kind of draw a quick picture here. Height of 4 over 2. We're trying to find this area that's trapped under the Estimate the area that's trapped under our parabola, our left half of the parabola, from 0 to 2 there. And we want to step that, break up that interval into four uh, pieces. So in general, if you want to figure out the base of the partition, your delta x size for any n partition, a 4 partition in this case, you take the end point of your interval, b, uh, and subtract the initial point of your interval, a. So, you know, your interval is 0, 2 a is 0, b is 2, and you divide it by the number of uh, rectangles you want to break your partition into, or steps. So 2 minus 0 gives us uh, gives us 2. Uh, divided by 4 pieces, 4 rectangles, gives us 2 over 4, which reduces to 1 half. So the base of our rectangles in this estimate are going to be 1 half. And so now that we know that, what we've, what we've done is it helps at this point to draw a quick x-axis. Um, from 0 to 1, break it into pieces of 4, so 4 half and half again gives us 1 half. Uh, delta x equals 1 half at every single step of the way. Delta x is going to equal 1 half. Same base, same width here. And you're going to go to, oh no, that's not right. I'm sorry, you all know that that's, that's not 1 half. Uh, I've done something wrong here. And the first thing I've done wrong is lose my place in the slides. But more importantly, here's what I've done wrong. This endpoint here, it's not one, it's two. And sure enough, now we can see it. What's halfway between zero and two? Well, one is. What's halfway between there? One half. And we, we decided our step size should be one half. So zero, one half, one, and three halves, or one and one half. But we like fractions, so we'll work with three halves there. OK, so now we know kind of what our interval looks like. Let's do this. So we're going to use left endpoint uh, approximation first. So let's draw a quick picture. I've done the calculations to save us a little bit of writing time, but I want to draw what this actually happening here. So we get a height of 4 over 2, 1, 1 half, and 3 halves. I'm going to draw our points there. OK, so 2 comma 4. From parabolas look something like this. And we know that 1 goes to 1 there. 1 squared is 1. 
So left endpoint approximation. What is our left endpoint going to look like, our first rectangle? Well, first rectangle, left endpoint. Let's first identify and color in our endpoints. The left endpoint of the second step is 1 half. The left endpoint of the third rectangle is going to be 1. And the left endpoint of the last rectangle is going to be 3 halves. So since the first rectangle is kind of funny, let's start with the blue rectangle. Well, that's going to be go up there till you hit your function, and there's your rectangle. Now the green one. Start at your input point, go up until you hit your function. The height of your function determines that rectangle. And then your last one, the black rectangle, height of the function is going to be the stop point. There we go. Now with that in our mind, over here, the red one, the height of the function is at zero, and so this rectangle actually contributes zero area there. What is the height of the function? Well, what's this point right here? That's f of zero. What's this point right here? Well, that's f of our input, one half. And it's more of the same game that we are doing before f of 1, and sure enough, f of 1 is equal to 1. Okay, so what have we got here? Last but not least, your final uh, fourth rectangle is defined by the height at the input 3 halves, which is over here somewhere, f of 3 halves, which I don't know what it is off the top of my head. Looks like it's 9 fourths. Okay, so let's use some colors to re represent that we have, what is this? This is the base of the rectangle times the height. Our base is 1 half, our height is 0 for the first rectangle. For the blue rectangle, our base is 1 half times our height is 1 quarter. f of 1 half is 1 half squared is 1 quarter. Our green rectangle, our base is, I'm sorry, that should be a flat line, our base is delta x, and then the height of the rectangle is determined by the output there. Sure enough, the height is 1 and the base is 1 half. And our, our fourth and final rectangle, once again, the base is our delta x, and the height is given to us by f of 3 halves, which is 9 fourths, and our base being 1 half. Add all that up, get a final answer estimate for the area of 1.75. So let's do this again a little bit faster. This time we're going to use, okay, I should do one last thing on this slide to make it real pretty. Second rectangle is blue, third rectangle is green, fourth rectangle is black. Doing that at the beginning probably would have been better. Again, with right endpoints. Once again, draw our graph in the corner. The input of two, one, three halves, one half and zero, goes up to one and four respectively, and a nice parabola there. Well, now we're doing right endpoints. So our first rectangle is going to be defined by 1 half. Our, next, our first rectangle is red. Our next rectangle is defined by 1. And you know what? Let's draw these rectangles while we're on the way. Right endpoint, looks like we're going to get an overcount. Uh, right endpoint, once again, for this function, we happen to get an overcount. Um, third rectangle is green. Uh, third rectangle is defined by 3 halves. Again, an overcount. And our final rectangle is the right endpoint of our last partition step, and that's right there to the top of our function. Okay, so our, again, I'm sorry, our base is always flat. So the first rectangle has a base of one half and a height of f of one half, one quarter, and that respectively. The base times the height is the base times the height, f evaluated at one. And the base delta x times the height f of 3 quarters gives us the base of 1 half, and f of 3 quarters is 9, nine quarters. There's a typo there. It's supposed to be half, and I bet you that's a typo on the other slide too. No, nope, just this one. Okay, fixed it. Uh, now last but not least, base height. Base height. f of 2 squared is 4. Add all that jazz up, get an area of 3.75. Now neither of these is a very good estimate because one was a, the first one was a fairly big undercount. The second one was a fairly big overshot, 3.75, because every area was overshot. So what's the actual area here? 
Well, here's where we get into Riemann sums and taking more and more bigger partitions. So approximate an area under f of x over a, b, and let p be any partition of a, b into n slices. Okay, so what's that look like? We take and we start any x, an x axis here, our input axis, and we go from a to b, and p is any partition. So you know what? We make a few slices, and then we just say keep slicing, and then keep slicing. And then we start making a few slices all of the same size as we get closer to our n. And we're going to label these x of 1, x of 2, x of 3, uh, because they're inputs, they're x values. And then over here, we've got our final one is going to be x of n minus 1. If you have an n partition, it's n minus 1 here. It doesn't really matter. x of n minus 2, and yada, 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 backwards. So any partition, you need to, we need to say that, hey, however we label these, we want to ensure that we're doing so logically. We want to ensure that the x of i's are ascending. In other words, we have that the a, our starting uh, point of the interval, is less than or equal to, well, no, it's equal to x0. I didn't actually tell you that, but a could be x0. And then b is going to actually be at xn there. Um, Uh, a is equal to x0 is less than x1. You can't have any of them be the same. You need them to be ascending until you get all the way up to xn minus 1, less than x of n, which is your stopping point of b. And so what is each interval width? Well, it's delta x. It's uniform. And it turns out you can actually let these be ununiform and different size partitions, it actually ends up not mattering because if we take the limit of this, of all these possible partitions, the slices get so small that they're basically infinitely thin. Um, but yeah, for now it's called uniform. And remember, we have a formula for that, and that delta x is equal to last guy minus start guy divided by the number of things you want to cut it up into. Okay, so now We've got this, and I'm going to draw it again, but a little bit bigger. And so for each interval, okay, so you've got your x-axis here, and you've got a equals x0, and then you've got x1, and then you've got x2, dot, 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 all the way up to xn minus 1, and then xn, which is our end point of b. Now for each interval there, you take an interior point, x well, let's call this the first inter, inter, interval, or we can number it however you want to, x0 star be that point. And then over here between x1 and x2, x1 star be another point. And then over here between our last, for every single one in the middle too, you're going to do that. And then over here on the last, just kind of grab a point inside of there and say let that be xn minus 1 star. And so you grab an interior point for every single one of those intervals. And each interior point where is going to be what we're going to use to estimate the area of each rectangle. So if we take this one, for instance, and look at, you know, some x-axis and then y-axis, and a starts here, uh, is equal to x0. And then we're interested between x1 and x2, and we choose this point right here is x1 star to be the thing we're going to define our rectangle height. Say that our function does something like this. Sure enough, this height relates to that point on the function. And for that interval, our rectangle is going to be that. Again, the area of that is going to be the base. And I'm going to write this as height times base, because base times height is the same thing as height times base. Well, your base is delta x, and your height is defined by f of x k star. And I'm using k as an arbitrary k here, because for every single uh, partition slice, you're going to do this same thing. So now, once we've established those rules, all we do is we sum these things up. So there we go. We take our approximate area will be the sum of all of these areas of these rectangles. So the area is going to be the sum summation notation from 1 to n of your heights 
based on an interior point for every interval times the base, the width of the base, the size of the step. Um, and these, that expression up there is called a Riemann sum. And so your question is always, how can we get a better area approximation? And so to do that, you take more and more slices. So you let n go to infinity. Or sometimes you see this written as delta x goes to zero. The size of your slices going to zero is the same thing as take, saying take more slices. And so the exact area under the curve can be uh, written as the limit as n goes to infinity, which again, depending on your text and who you're talking to, sometimes is written as delta x going to zero means the same thing. Limit as n goes to infinity of that Riemann sum above gets you the best estimate. And this is actually what a, is the, the definition of a definite integral. So please forgive those. So here it is, Riemann sum definition of a definite integral. The definite integral, the area, quote, area under the curve of f of x, d of x, um, is going to be the limit of the all of those possible potential partitions, take it n to infinity, taking infinitely thin slices. So if it exists, that function is said to be integrable over that interval. And that is the end of this. Next, we'll talk about properties of definite integrals.